call the meeting to order at 630. Um, we'll do roll call. Mike Bollier. Hebron, Michael Bollier, Hebron. Mike Sharon. Mike Sharon, he Hebron. Uh, Joe Coletti. Joe Coletti, Hebron. Kirsten Erlinson. Kirsten Erlinson, Hanover. Pam Farrington is not here today. Carrie Ferlino. Drew Golfin. Drew Golfin, Marlboro. Okay, um, Gabe Marks. Amy Romanchuk. Amy Romanchuk, Marlboro. Scott Soyet. Scott Soyet, Andover. And Heather Summer from Hebron. So if we can all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I am three on the agenda of uh, public comments. Hebron, Andover, and Marlboro community engagement and attendance at BOE public meetings is welcome. The public comment segment of the meeting agenda is set aside so the BOE may receive public comments. Procedurally, public remarks will be limited to three minutes and citizens will be asked to identify themselves. Because the BOE is limited by the Freedom of Information Act to discussing only matters on the agenda, the BOE is not permitted to engage in the discussion of the comments presented. Is there anybody that would like to make public comments? Okay. So we will go on to item four, which is um, adding and deleting any agenda items. Okay. That brings us to the student rep report. David? Of course. Hello, everyone. Um, so to start off, the juniors have their um, junior SAT, um, I believe, this Wednesday, actually. So that's pretty exciting. I'm sure nerve-wracking for many juniors. Um, also, with the juniors, there's junior prom coming up, which is in a while. But however, tickets are being sold for the junior prom, which everyone's getting pretty excited about. Um, it's a pretty exciting time for everyone, seeing as it's their first prom. Um, also, last week we, there was a dr blood drive held um, in the high school cafeteria, and many students contributed and donated blood for a great cause. So that was a tremendous success. Um, also, there is a coffee and conversation with the superintendent coming up, and uh, students are welcome to come and have some coffee and just chit chat and um, kind of get to know their superintendent. Um, and that concludes my uh, report. Have Thank you guys you. done that before? Done a... I've done them. If anybody from the community is welcome. Do, do typically students? I've not had students come to the idea. You're giving me an idea. Eva. Yeah, maybe you should promote it, promote it. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. that's a great idea. I think that would honestly, like, I oh, think wait, it's I such a good coffee. idea because I think people would really get, like, I think it's a great way to like actually engage with you yeah. and like I think it's a great way to get to know you. So yeah. and if the message came from you, I think that would have That'd value. Be great. Yeah. I can't serve coffee, I'm being told by my business manager who is also my food and beverage person. But <laughs> I, have, <laughs> uh, I probably can't even serve hot chocolate because it's probably against our food certification yes. too. But I'll give you water. Wow. <laughs> the How's that sound? Sounds super inviting. Hey, yeah. Is coffee mean, not healthy? It is not healthy. Oh, boy. Sure works for me. <laughs> <laughs> really well, I got it. It's the point where all we can drink is water. <laughs> hey, I mean, hydrate and say hello. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you, Ava. All right, then it comes to um, chair report. So first, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come out for um, the roles and responsibility session. It, I thought it was really great. Um, 
gave me a lot of things to think about. I thought her presentation was great, and I really appreciate everybody taking the time to, to do that. Um, this past week, I attended the Ram High School Winter Athletics Award Night, uh, which I always enjoy. My favorite thing is the slideshow. It's There's a lot of effort that goes into the slideshow representing all of the different um, teams for that particular season. Um, Dan had quite a lot to report out on because the teams have been doing exceptionally well this year. There were 86 scholar athletes, and those are students who um, get an 87 or above in their um, grades for that particular season. That is, um, they had 18 all-conference recipients. They had four all-state recipients, and I think um, I think Cheer was the first time they ever had one that was an all-state recipient. Yeah. Um, There's a good article about her. Dan Kudrier, yeah. yep, she was in the River East last week. The wrestling team uh, was recognized as the CCC East Division champs and Class M state champs. Cheer team was uh, CCC East Division champs, Class M second runner-up, and they qualified to go on to New England um, championships. How'd they do? Uh, we're done. <laughs> After states, if depending on if they had scored um, six and above, they got to go to the next mm. tournament, which was called Team of the Year. If they go got to third and above, they got to go to New England. So um, after that one championship, they sure got two more uh, competitions after that. So I think most of the parents are uh, a little relieved that it's over because it goes on since August. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to touch on quickly is you may have noticed that we haven't been doing the student program uh, um, highlights for mm -hmm. the past couple of months. And it, that's a decision that was made just simply, I mean, I love them. I, I want them to come back, but mm -hmm. our agendas have been really packed. Um, so we're trying to, you know, in the interest of time, make sure that the meetings don't go on too long. There is a policy that we have that if the meeting does go on until 930, we have to vote and have a two thirds majority to um, extend the meeting past 930. If um, we decide we vote and we don't want to extend the meeting past 930, then you know, we have the option of either scheduling a special meeting or taking those agenda items and moving them onto the agenda for the next month. So just as a measure of awareness, when I you know, looked at the agenda today, I was like, wow. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention for um, it is one of the policies. And that goes over to you. Well, so thank you. I, I, I want to just start by thanking uh, our board members. It is March's board, uh, board of Ed Appreciation Month. And I want to thank you for the work that you do for the students, staff, and community. We are fortunate to have you uh, working on behalf of, of all of us and advocating for us in the district. Um, and there are some small tokens of appreciation um, at your spaces. Uh, just a little something to say thank you. A um, little Ram swag, which uh, usually is, is Always good to have ramp swag, so um, and something that would not go for the healthy food certification. I was going to say that kind of violates that policy. Yeah, but we're not in school day right now, so you know, <laughs> we're good. Um, so, just a, a couple of things that I wanted to mention: um, uh, the Ram chapter of the National Business Honor Society held an induction ceremony on February 27th at Ram High School. In order to be eligible for uh, to be a member of the society, they must be a junior or a senior. Um, they must have completed or be currently enrolled in their third business class and have maintained, um, I think it's a, a 3.5 GPA in those business classes. And we ended up having 19 new members inducted. Um, as the board knows, we have a strong business program, a strong DECA program, and uh, a strong interest in that. Um, it's, it, they're great. Great classes, great program. Um, speaking of RAM students, I'll talk a little bit about future students. Um, I was invited to go to Hebron Public Schools um, to their invention convention, and Dr. Sharusi, uh, Mary Rose Mead uh, joined me um, as well, and we served as judges at the Hebron Invention Convention. And so, just so you know, it's a it's a uh, something that they do every year. Students come up with ideas about a new invention and then they have to create it and then they have to uh, be able to show the judges what it is, what it does, what its intended purpose is. 
Um, and then winners get moved on to the state competition. It's a great event. And I will tell you, there's a lot of creative future RAM students um, that we got to see and interact with. It was a really neat, neat experience. One of the, my favorite things to, to do. Um, uh, finally, uh, it's something that Ava highlighted real quick. Uh, we did have our blood drive last Thursday, I believe. I donated uh, because Kathy Green uh, chastised me because the last time we had a blood drive, I had already donated someplace else. So I made sure I donated for, for RAM. Um, we collected, oh, Kathy and her, her medical career students collected 81 pints of blood. Um, and this is the third and final blood drive that they did for the year. And in totality, um, they collected 201 pints of blood for all three drives. And what um, Kathy told us about uh, is that each pint of blood that is donated can save up to three lives. So it's a pretty remarkable thing if you think about 600 lives being impacted by the students and RAM community. Um, so uh, again, just another one of the great things that we do here. So that concludes my, uh, my report. Great. Okay, so that brings us to item eight, approval of minutes. Could I just step yep. in? So I just I, I just want to step in. So approving the minutes from the February 26th meeting, I, I did push an email out, but I didn't necessarily expect people have a chance to read it because it was this afternoon. In your place is just a little bit of an updated lecture, is an updated version of the minutes from the February 26th meeting. The changes were, were minor. Uh, it, we did roll call votes because, because now we're doing virtual meetings. If it's not unanimous, we're doing roll call. The initial meeting minutes didn't reflect the actual roll call vote, but that has been updated to reflect the roll call votes of board members. And then the only other thing that I did is I added a little bit, uh, we added a little bit more specific information related to um, the discussion related to the strategic plan. So, so the meeting minutes that we would be approving are the ones that are in front of you, and those are the only changes um, uh, uh, to, to those minutes. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we have a motion to approve the minutes for the regular February 26, 2024 Board of Ed meeting. Sure, I'll make a motion. Okay. A second? I'll say it. Second. Mike Bollier, Hebrew. Mike Bollier. From Hebron seconded the motion. I have one correction. My name was misspelled on the old one. They fixed that, and now it's misspelled a different place on this one. <laughs> so the very first one, my my name's misspelled. So I don't care if we change it. <laughs> we'll we'll change it. So we'll, we'll change. Yes, that's not a problem. But just in the in the call to order yep. section, right? Uh, <clears throat> I haven't read through everything else. To make sure it's <laughs> right elsewhere. But I thought I got changed. Fix one place. Okay, any other discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Fucking like I went too fast. <laughs> All right. Um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes for the special workshop March 4th, 2024, Board of Education meeting? I'll make the motion. Joe Coletti made the, made the motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Amy Romanchuk. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. She carries. That brings us to old business. <clears throat> um, Nine point one is the budget update. So just uh, I'll say a couple of things and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, turn it over to Eva to to share a little bit greater detail. Um, the good news is is uh, we're, we're we're trending in a good direction with regards to our budget increase for next year. The uh, the board may recall that I had initially proposed an increase of a 2.64 percent. Um, we are now at a 2.1 percent increase for next year. Um, I did go and present at both. Hebron and Andover to their boards of finance and or boards of selectmen uh, last week. I will tell you that our the budget that I had proposed to them at that time was a 264. I told them that I wanted to talk to you all as board members first, share where we are with the 2.1, and that I would update those towns accordingly. Um, I, I will just say anecdotally, the feedback that I got on our on our budget presentation to those two towns, uh, as well as with Marlboro, was, was well received. Um, in fact, one of the boards of uh, bo uh, selectmen from one of the towns said, you know, if we didn't have the bond reduction of 600 some odd thousand dollars, we'd be somewhere in the neighborhood of four point something percent. He said that would be reasonable in today's economic times. And I said, I appreciate you recognizing that. Um, but again, I just I, we're in a good place at a two point one. 
Um, at Your Places as well is a, a, a document. It's a two-sided document, I believe. Uh, it says business services on the top, and it says um, both, uh, it says administrative uh, budget adjustments as well as adjustments to um, revenue. So if uh, Eva's going to talk a little bit uh, about and give a high-level overview of this, and we can certainly take any questions that people might have. So as Colin stated, um, we're sitting at a 2.1 currently. Um, we did a review and your first page, that or the top page, which is a little bit shorter, you have some revenue increases of $162,307. In addition, you have a capital improvement increase, which is unfortunate, of $1,358 for the Kubota motor, uh, mower that um, we were proposing to purchase. And the second page, which is a little bit longer, you have total reductions and total addition to the uh, general operating budget. So um, the reductions were $48,888.25. The additions were $43,165 for overall reduction to the gross operating budget of $5,723.25. Um, in totality, um, this nets us out to 166,672 of reductions overall. Are there any questions? Somewhere, I don't know, email or somewhere we saw that Marlboro was asking for a reduction. Um, this more than covers what they were, the amount they were asking for. They so, cover so, what they were. So uh, just, if I could just give context, yeah. I, I'm glad you brought this up. So so yes, we did receive a communication from the, Mar from the chair of the Marlboro Board of Finance. Um, um, so uh, their request was to reduce their portion of the levy by $150,000, not reduce it in totality. At a 2.64%, that would have required about a $410,000 reduction to our overall budget. Um, I think that would be difficult to accomplish. I did inform the, the, the Board of Finance uh, chair when I talked to him. I said, we are anticipating some reductions. I said, again, I need to respect, be, out of respect for my board, talk to them about it first. And then I can come back and share with you what the reduction is. So there was a reduction to their town levy as a result of the reduction that we're talking about. It's not at $150,000. Um, Eva was kind enough to actually do the calculations for me today. Uh, to tell us exactly what our budget would have needed to be reduced by to get to 150,000 from Marlboro. And I inadvertently left that upstairs in my office, but I could email the board. But I'm thinking it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 280 ish. So I feel like it was 240 that we would need more to reduce to get them down to the 150. But I feel like bringing them down to 210 was in the area of 60,000 more that yeah. got reduced to them. And, and I, I did explain to the people that I spoke with, it was both the town manager from Marlboro who I spoke with, as well as the, the chair of the board of finance. I, I, I explained to him that the challenge associated with doing that, that, you know, I, I, you know, I said our responsibility as a board and my responsibility as a superintendent is to bring forth a budget that is representative of the needs of the entire district. And I just think that it's as much as I think we are a good partner to the, to the sending towns. And I think the fact that we are providing us they're having a significant credit offset with regards to the surplus that they're getting back for the for next year, which is helping reduce their levy already. Um, I, I just what I explained to him was I, I can't put myself in a position where I could recommend to, to the RAM board that we start in reducing our budget and taking away things, materials, resources um, th that would negatively impact our district. Um, to get to a certain number for a town. Um, I, I think that that just creates a, a, a real challenge. Um, and, and, and again, I, I think if, if you look, and I said this to, the, to them when I spoke to them, is if you look at the landscape of budget increases for, for school districts across the state, a 2.1 is amongst the lowest. There, there's no doubt about it. Um, we're certainly the lowest of the, th of the four towns, of the three towns that feed into them. Um, and in some cases by a significant amount so uh, you know I, I think it would be a challenge for us to try to do much more than what we've already done
Um, so that brings us to 9.2, which is the second read of policies. Uh, nine, <clears throat> excuse me, 9.2A, policy 9314, board meeting conduct. Rec we have a recommend, do we have a motion to adopt policy 9314, board meeting conduct as presented? I make motion. Scott Soyet. Scott Soyet. Drew Galpin second. Drew Galpin second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Um, the next one, 9 2 B. We have a motion to adopt policy 1331, prohibition against smoking community as presented. Drew Golfin motion. Drew Golfin. Do we have a second? I'll second. Joe, Joe Coletti. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Okay, 9.2C. Do we have a motion to adopt policy 4154 and 4254, suspected abuse or neglect of adults with disability as presented? Do we have, do we have a motion? Make the motion. I think somebody else is there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to trade them off. <laughs> Scott Soyette, do we have a second? A second. Amy Romanchuk, seconded. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. That brings us to 9.2D. Uh, do we have a, um, a motion to adopt policy 4180 and 4280, increasing educator diversity as presented? I'll make the motion. Joe Coletti, do we have a second? I'll second. Mike Bollier, any discussion? Just that this is, I, I was reading the statutes and we have to have a policy pretty much exactly like this. There's, there's very little wiggle room here. Anybody else? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, that brings us to 9.2E. Do we have a motion to adopt policy 5545, use of private technology devices by students as presented? I'll make a motion. Drew Golfin. We have a second. A second. Scott Soyat. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. All right. 9.2 F. We have a motion to delete policy 9405 board member electronic participation. Make the motion. Mike Bollier, we have a second. A second. A second. Scott Soyet, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that motion passes. 9.2G. We have a motion to delete 4195 and 4295, prohibition against smoking personnel. I'll make a motion to delete. Drew Golfin, a second? A second. Uh, Kristen Erlinson. Any discussion? Just that we said before, this is covered elsewhere now. It's Correct. The reason we're deleting. We are not advocating for smoking. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's covered under the community policy now. It encompasses yes. personnel, students, and members. Of the community. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. 9.2H. Do we have a motion to delete policy 5131, prohibition against smoking for students? I'll make the motion. Mike Bollier? A second. Second from Scott Soyette. Any discussion? Ditto. 
<laughs> oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That was yeah. quick. You, great. That's good. Motive three. Brings us to new business. Um, 10.1. We have a motion to transfer $205,323 as presented in enclosure 10.1 to fund the costs of identified one time purchases. I'll make the motion. Joe Coletti, a second? A second. Amy Romanchuk, any discussion? The instruments are expensive. The, the, the thing that I'll just, I think it's important to get this on the record um, is, you know, by making these purchases with our current funds that we have for our net favorable position, we're investing essentially in future budgets, right? There, there's, there's a few items that had initially been in the 23, 20, I'm sorry, the initial 24, 25 budget that we took out um, just because we, they were things that we felt we might be able to purchase in the manner that we're doing right now. Um, and there are other things uh, that, that we're purchasing that basically by purchasing where, with our current <coughs> funds that we have, we're essentially saving money we'll off the budget less. We're gonna have to get them eventually, so it makes really good sense for us to use the funding that we have available. So I appreciate the board support. This is also something that we did discuss in facilities and finance subcommittee. And so I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah. So we did discuss this and I thought the MS team and the chairs so, it's being removed yes. the so the change was made on Friday, and I believe the change was updated to the board packet on Friday. So the online version, you will see it. Unfortunately, you have a hard copy. So, so the total, just so I have the total, two hundred five four thirty three. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Yep. Three twenty three. Two hundred five three twenty three. Three twenty three. I, I changed it one place. Two hundred five <laughs> three. Whatever, whatever the motion was, <laughs> just ignore it. <laughs> I, I made one change. Well, we had, it, uh, I had written two or five of them. Yeah, when we had initially posted yeah. the agenda, we weren't quite sure if we were going to be able to get those conference room chairs and right. elsewhere. And so we found out that we did. We did update it on the website. We did update it in the packet. So, that, but if you had printed it prior to that update, which it right. sounds like you did, that's why I had to run over to you. I printed okay. it before it was up to you. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion passes. 10.2. We have a motion to approve the reallocation of $290,000 from capital non recurring unallocated to the middle school baseball field accessibility project. I'll make the motion. Joe Coletti, a second. I'll second. Mike Bollier, any discussion? So, uh, uh, and Mike Sharon, you might want to jump in uh, to this because I know that obviously you've been a big part of this. So just just to refresh everybody's memory, um, this was this was actually something that we had discussed doing as a part of our capital budget for next year. Um, we had we had developed different tiers of capital projects. We had about a five hundred thousand dollar tier, which is ultimately what the board accepted, and, and we've moved forward with. We had a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar tier, and then we had a third tier. Um, the the the, the seven hundred fifty thousand dollar tier was inclusive of this project, and 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 this is actually something that in I think it was two thousand and ten, uh, an ADA compliance audit was conducted by the state. And we actually had to make some investments on the accessibility for our softball field, accessibility for our comp field, for our concession stand. And that audit that was conducted was solely for the high school. However, when that person was here conducting the audit, they did say, if we, if we audited the middle school, you'd have to fix that middle school accessibility for the baseball field as well. And so, um, Ultimately, the coming out of the capital conversations and the budget was it's an important project. We should be proactive as opposed to reactive, which we were last time, um, and invest the money while we have it. Mike, hopefully I captured that. Yes. You, you did. Can you hear me? 
Yes. All right. Great. Yeah. I think not only is it an important thing that we have to do, but it's something that to your point that we will be required to do in the future, but we just don't know when. So again, this is an offset, I think, to a future expenditure that we're avoiding at this time. And so uh, if we're being fiscally conscious and spending uh, available dollars today without building those into a future budget. So I endorse it. So I have a question on the, the timing. Yeah. Does this change in where it's located from capital budget to a specific fund for this project change when it happens no so um the capital non-recurring fund and the cip project are funds that can roll forward so they're not a fiscal year based project okay. so we can start it as soon as tomorrow if, if um we had the wherewithal to do that um if the board approves it tonight um, if not, it's, it's put into our planning and Michael starts um, going into bed and doing what needs to be done. So how is this affected? How does this affect the budget process? So it saves, like um, Dr. McNamara was stating, it saves future dollars. Um, so um, we're spending money that we've already taxed taxpayers on. So we don't have to retax them for a future project coming down the pipe. Right, because this is from the, the two surplus. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but this doesn't affect the actual budget no. book. That no, no, that's a different allocation. Right. So that, just to yeah. make sure I was clear. I also was wondering, just what kind of accuracy do we expect from numbers like this? Yeah. So it's a great question. So. In the memo that uh, Michael Schlehoff, our director of facilities, had provided, and is actually in closure 10.2, um, we always want to be as accurate as we can. And so, the, uh, and I might be mispronouncing it, so I apologize. It's Lorenio Engineering Associates is a company that Michael has utilized in the past um, to uh, give us an idea about what we should anticipate for um, a budget. And so, you know, soft costs, as, he, as it says in the memo, you know, design, engineering, bid document, going out to bid, doing all the legwork to get ready to go to bid um, is, is going to be approximately $40,000 uh, with uh, construction costs at, at approximately $250,000. He, he does note in his memo that is with some contingency funds, right? right? We're, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that we can come in underneath the $250,000 for the actual construction costs. Um, but it, it makes it uh, a little bit easier for us if we run into a situation where um, costs are, you know, materials costs, subcontractor costs are a little higher than we had initially anticipated. We, um, we did get this quote really recently, um, which is why when we had initially had this on the second tier, the total cost of the entire project was approximately $250,000. And so the 290 is reflective of that updated, uh, updated anticipated cost. But th there, there are variables that come into it. Um, but it's something like this when it's, you know, still pretty generic, is it a pessimistic estimate? I mean, or do they try to be as realistic as possible? They try to be as realistic as possible but I'll note the with contingency. Well, right, right. Yes. I mean, you, you, yeah. you can't get it yeah. right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's hard. Yeah. You know, how close you get is the, is, is, is the target, is, you know, Correct. is the metric here. Correct. <laughs> but I, I was just curious because, you know, rough numbers like 250 and 40 is like, okay, well, you know, yeah. just curious. Any other discussion on that? Okay, we're all all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Yep. So, so the next agenda item, which now I'm losing my place. Ten point three. Thank you. Is the discussion of possible action related to the completion uh, to the competition field in the three sixteen North Field projects and. And again, I'm going to um, ask Mike Sharon at any point to, to jump in. Mike's been really intimately involved as the chair of the uh, facility subcommittee meeting with this. Um, so we've we've been really working to address uh, some some issues related to our our, our fields, um, our athletic fields. You know, uh, and and it's been through the use of that two percent capital non recurring fund. Um, and, and last year, the district uh, worked very closely with a um, consulting firm, a, a, a landscape consulting firm, 
And we had identified uh, we had identified the projects and we had them actually kind of to your point, Scott, we had them give us some anticipated costs for if we were to do the different things that we, we needed to do. And we had some alternatives um, as well based off of some of the information that they provided to us. Um, and ultimately the finance subcommittee prioritized the two projects that we're looking to uh, do as, as priority number one and priority number two. And that is to uh, continue to work to um, get our competition field as from a, from a um, field quality perspective as, as good as it can possibly be. Um, one of the things that that field does not have is a, what's called a perimeter drain. Um, so that excess rainwater can can drain off into a, um, and have a drainage system. Right now, it drains. Uh, it doesn't. Dra it drains okay, but it drains onto the track, um, which the track is in rough shape. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that comes back to us sometime soon as a as a as a something that we're going to have to address as well. Um, but before we address the track, we need to address the perimeter drain so that if we put a new track in, it doesn't get. Um, damaged. Um, so we went out to bid for, oh, I'm sorry. So, so that's project number one. And then the other project is, is we, we call the fields 316 North and 316 South. Those are the fields adjacent to uh, Wall Street um, that are utilized by our fall and um, uh, spring sports, football, soccer, lacrosse, boys and girls lacrosse. Um, and there is uh, the quality of the turf is not where we'd like it to be. Um, it's, it's in rough shape. And then there's also, uh, there's dips and there's unevenness that we'd like to address as well. Um, and so those are the two projects that we had identified the, the uh, facility subcommittee had identified to address. Um, and so we went out to bid, um, we went out to bid one, one time. We actually didn't get, uh, responsive, um, um, responsive proposals that we were wanted to move forward with. So we went out to bid a second time and we ended up getting four proposals um, in your board packet. Enclosure 10.3 shows the uh, different bids that we received by the four different companies. Um, and as you can see, the proposals ranged from 121,999 for the base project to well over $500,000. By two other companies, that's a huge spread. That's a huge, huge spread. And so, what we had talked about um, again, Eva, Michael Schleyhofer, Mike Sharon, myself, uh, and and our consultants that we've been working with, landscape architect and architect and a turf consultant, felt the best thing for us to do would be to do what's called a scope meeting because when you have this variance in in the in the quotes. Um, between the, the two lower bidders, the one at 129, and then there's one, you know, the next one up is um, 358. Uh, it comes to our mind is, is the, are the bids that are being put forward, are, are, they, are they responsive to what we need done or, or are they not responsive? And that's the technical term, whether, whether a bid is responsive or not responsive. Um, and so we met with Liberty Landscapes uh, and we met with AquaTurf uh, a few weeks ago to have what's known as a scope meeting. That's where we developed questions um, uh, and, and we posed those questions to those two lowest bidders. And, um, and essentially uh, through that process, we determined um, as, as a collective group um, that the lowest bid of Liberty Landscaping was, was not responsive. Uh, so I apologize, thank you, was for AquaTurf was, was not responsive. Um, and the reason for that determination is because, again, the, the low material cost that they anticipated, there was a significant concern on the part of the group that met with them that it wouldn't be able to cover the cost of the materials that were necessary. It wouldn't be enough to cover the cost of the labor that was necessary. And there was not concrete and consistent responses with regards to timeline um, during the context of the meeting. Um, it, it, we didn't necessarily feel like they understood the scope of it to give us a definitive timeline for when, the, how long it would take to, to go through the process of, of getting those projects completed. So as a result of this process, um, again, it was determined that AquaTurf is, is a non-responsive bid, um, which and, and, and the recommendation of the of, of the group, Michael, Eva, myself, and our two consult and, and Mike Schleyhofer and the two consultants is, 
is to go with Liberty Landscapes. Um, it, and, and I will say, I don't have the dollar amount in front of me, um, but I will tell you that the 358 in total project cost is approximately, is pretty close to what um, Tom or what advisors or consultants had said the, the, the approximate cost of, of that project, of these projects would be. That's an awful lot of talking for me and uh, I will be quiet. And uh, Mike, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add to that. I knew you were gonna hand it over to me. Um, it, you're a tough act to follow. I think you covered just about every point that I wanted to, to make, but it's, it's important to note that the uh, the advisement of our our turf uh, architects was was critical in, in, uh, in holding that, that scope uh, meeting. I think it was very productive. And I think the outcome is, is the one that uh, we probably anticipated, but I feel good really good going forward with Liberty. Uh, I think that they're going to uh, be able to complete this job. Um, and one of the most important and critical aspects is timing, right? Our, our sports teams require the use of those fields and they require them to be available to them uh, on a certain schedule. And so Liberty was uh, confident in their uh, depiction of the execution of the, of the uh, project in a manner that would, they would align with that timing. So I think that's, that was critical. The other thing that I wanted to bring up, and perhaps this is a, a topic of conversation for the board at a future time, but uh, Colin did mention that the um, the track itself is, is I would call it in a state of disrepair at this point, and it is likely going to be, need to become a priority for us. We've got uh, two additional fields that need to be addressed. Outfield, <coughs> baseball outfield, bless you, um, as well as... Um, the other 316 field, right? There's two fields, as Colin mentioned. Um, so those both still remain to be addressed, but we're likely going to have to take a look at investing in, in the track itself and the replacement. And in order to do so, the advantage of having the uh, the perimeter drains done is it will enable us to go ahead and, and attack that, that track replacement in the future. So not necessarily something we have to get into detail now, but I wanted to at least float it so that the board was aware of something that we'll need to get into in the future. Okay. So do we have a motion to authorize the superintendent, Colin McNamara, to finalize and execute a contract with Liberty Landscapes LLC for the competition field drainage and improvements to 316 Northfield projects? So moved. Oh, Michael. Oh, Mike Sharon, do I have a second? Okay. Scott Soyette. Any discussion? We move the decision on the drain be made. So they're upgrading from eight to 12. So um, <clears throat> there's a facilities uh, subcommittee mm -hmm. that is scheduled for, that's on the on the calendar already for next Tuesday, I believe, Mike, if I'm correct. Correct. And uh, I actually was just talking with Mike today about <clears throat> that agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and we plan on having that conversation at, the agenda, uh, at that meeting. Is that something that will require board action? Uh, no, because it, 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 I mean, Mike, jump in if you, if you want to, but, um, you know, I, I, I think what the board is authorizing me to do here in this meeting is to enter into a contract with Liberty Landscaping. Whether or not we go with an eight inch pipe or a 12 inch pipe is guidance and direction that I can get from the facility subcommittee. And then I can enter into the proper contract for either an eight or 12. J just Mike, you might, do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. It's just since it's out there, I think it's good that we all talk about it so everybody knows what we're discussing. Yep, happy to do so. Um, one of the reasons that we would consider upgrading from an 8-inch drainage to a 12-inch drainage is in the event that we were ever going to uh, decide to go with um, artificial turf. Um, the artificial turf drains at a much more rapid pace, uh, and so as a result, you require the ability to move more, more water at a, at a quicker uh, rate. Um, my position on this, and uh, we're going to get into it, as Colin mentioned, next Tuesday, but my position is that we're making a commitment to cultivating and, and nurturing our, our natural athletic fields. And that's something that we've been talking about now for over a year. Um, I would anticipate that that endeavor will be successful, uh, not only because we feel like we've got the right organizations involved in helping us understand exactly what steps need to be taken, but we all already have in place uh, an excellent program that maintains and cares for those fields. So I anticipate that we'll be successful in that effort. As a result of that, I don't necessarily think that we're going to turn toward uh, artificial turf in, in the near future. 
Um, and my anticipation is that if we did decide to do so, it would likely be as much as a decade in the future. And at that time, uh, we don't know if the requirements will change or other factors may come into play that would require us to take a different approach at the drainage in that area. So my recommendation at this time would be for us to stick with the, the eight inch. Um, I think that's probably all I have to offer. <laughs> <clears throat> So I was going to ask what HDP is, but it's some kind of pipe. Correct. <laughs> it's a it's a plastic pipe. Yep. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. Do we so, have well, actually, so right now we're not making a decision to do that that pipe, or we're making a decision not to to do the the twelve inch pipe. Or the, we're still waiting. The facility subcommittee meeting, we'd like to make a recommendation uh, on Tuesday whether or not to pursue that. Okay. So that's not part of this decision. It's for the, the, the main there, the 358,000. Correct. So so right right now, it's it's the decision is that the, the, the motion would be to allow me to enter into a contract with Liberty Landscaping. It's a broad motion. I would get guidance from the facility subcommittee on Tuesday, after, on Tuesday's meeting, it'll be an agenda item for them. They'll discuss it, and then they'll give me the direction to say, "All right, we we think it's best to do eight inch pipe, or we think it's best to do twelve inch pipe." And then the contract that I enter into Liberty will be reflective of that guidance. Liberty's the only one who had a, such a huge fee for the, that pipe. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, that was a significant amount of their contract. Yeah. If it was RAD or Greenway or number for getting Aquaturf, it was one of the other two that yeah, the, the price might be worth doing regardless, but yeah, fifty-eight thousand dollars is not a change. Well, there, there's it's interesting. Uh, you learn so much. Like I didn't know I'd become so knowledgeable about drainage and pipes. But one of the <laughs> things that they talked about, um, and and might jump in if I'm mischaracterizing it, but you know we talked about well the potential to does it make sense, even if it's five years from now, seven years from now, to put in a 12 inch or, or even 10 years from now? To, to Mike's point, um, you don't know what the requirements are going to be if the standards are going to change. And the other thing is, and this is where this is the learning for me, is if you put in a 12 inch pipe for a grass field, there's maintenance costs that you'll have to incur on a regular basis because it's actually not good to have too big of a pipe because it can get like sludge in it and it has to get blown out. And it, it, again, just the things that you learn. So, um, but yeah, that's absolutely, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, what happens is the, the, the flow rate in the pipe is, is uh, much very low and it doesn't self clean. Uh, in addition to that, when you go from an eight inch pipe to a 12 inch pipe, you're removing more material from the, from the ground. You have to remove that material and also backfill to a greater degree with, uh, crushed rock and other materials to ensure that it's installed properly. So there was quite a bit that went into it. Um, we we queried Liberty a great deal on why it was so much, uh, and and they did a reasonable job of explaining why that would be a uh, fifty-eight thousand dollars or fifty-three thousand dollars. So just to be clear, the vote tonight would be for the whole package, and the facility subcommittee will determine down the road whether it will be. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. yeah. <clears throat> Just want that in there. Well, there's some finance here. Yeah. 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 Just want everybody to know. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mike, you were in favor, right? I'm in favor. <laughs> uh, I was a little delayed on that. It was a little delayed. I was like, what is happening here? I was okay. on mute. All right. So um, that brings us to 10.4. Um, this is a discussion about passable action related to healthy food certification. It's your enclosure 10.4 in your packet. Do you want me to speak to a few people? Sure, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's out. <laughs> I should have brought water to you. <laughs> so All right, so basically, currently, um, we are a healthy food certified district. So, this is our annual renewal process that we go through 
to ensure that we want to stay a healthy food certified district. Um, in the past three years, so from 21 to 23, we've earned $26,827 being a healthy food district. So basically, the state of Connecticut is much more stringent than the federal government when it comes to snacks and um, other items. So again, we can't sell coffee to kids. We can't sell um, candy to kids. Selling means they can't earn it. Um, fundraisers, um, because we're healthy food, need to be distributed after the close of business to um, allow for certain exemptions after the close of business. So close of business is considered 30 minutes after the end of the school day. We can, and those are a couple of items that will be um, the board will be voting on um, allow for um, so when you're um, selling at the concession stands at the event as long as you're selling it at the event you can sell the soda or the chips or those things that everybody wants to eat and dine on um, but during the school day we have to try to be as healthy as possible okay so the rec recommended motion is Pursuant to um, Connecticut General Statute Section 10215F, Regional School District 8 certifies that all food items offered for sale to students in the schools under its jurisdiction and not exempted from the Connecticut Nutrition Standards published by the Connecticut State Department of Education will comply with the Connecticut Nutrition Standards during the period of July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. This certification shall include all food offered for sale to students separately from reimbursable meals at all times and from all sources, including but not limited to school stores, vending machines, school cafeterias, culinary programs, and any fundraising activities on school premises sponsored by the school or non-school organizations and groups. Do we have a motion to... And this is not legislative. I'll wait till the discussion period. Mm -hmm. So I'll make a motion. Okay, that's Drew Golfin. Do we have a second? Sure, a second. Scott Soyet. So this is a, this is not one of the, this is sort of an optional Correct. program and there's, so you say we, we've gotten 26,000 over the last three years? Correct. So basically, okay. yeah, so yes, yeah, so, they, so they're not, so they're still encouraging districts to comply with as opposed to forcing it down people's throats, I guess is the best way to explain that. Um, not politically correct, but it's the best way to explain it. Um, so this is a way to encourage our children to learn and to make healthy choices about it. Now, how, what's the estimate of the number of kids who are? leaving here to go to Dunkin' Donuts to get a coffee during the day? I'm sure it's very hot. No, they're not allowed to leave during the day. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying, you know, on the... So before school or after school, okay. maybe, but during the day, not, not a lot. Okay. Um, once they leave, they're supposed to be not coming back to school. So off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Public meeting. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think the money's worth it. I'll give you my... I, 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 I just, yeah, that's my take on it. It'd be nice to get, you know, somebody's a little tired. These kids get out of bed early. I'm not saying that. So no even more. if there wasn't healthy food, I still can't serve coffee to kids in the state of Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about, what about a, chocolate? Yeah. Um, no, just, chocolate. Just so, so chocolate as an incentive, if we didn't have this, yes. What about a, a coffee vending machine? That's outlawed too? Outlawed too, in, oh, in okay. schools and states. So this is again one of the yes. legislative mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at lunch, can they buy like snacks? Yeah. 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 They would be able to buy different snacks, right. but they would still have to follow the Connecticut nutritional standards, which are still higher than the But the band government. can sell candy bars if we vote this down. Um, so the mm -hmm. child can have a candy bar, yes, if this gets made a difference can they, can during the school. But, but they, can, they can't distribute. So what you're talking about, the band selling Remember candy back bar. When I, we were in high school. The sure. So, 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 so technically they, they could they can they can do a fundraiser yeah. that could be out of compliance with this, correct? Yeah. Yeah. But they can't distribute it during the context of the school day. It has to be given to them. So but buy a chocolate bar, yes. Right. So Mr. Bull, you're saying so back in the day. Oh, back in the day, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The day was great. Oh, no, no, back in the day was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
oh my to God. clarify what I think you were getting at is that if the band were to have a, a chocolate bar fundraiser, they could distribute them during their evening rehearsals or well, or now, other social gatherings. Well, that's sounds rehearsal, rehearsal, right? If we adopt this healthy event. school district business nonsense, whatever you want to call it, the band wouldn't even be able to engage in a fundraiser selling chocolate bars. During, during the school day. At all? No, 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 just during school day. So right. even if we're a healthy so, district? Right. So okay. if you're a healthy district, so if you say yes to number one, you have options for two and three. Okay. And that refers to your food items exemption and your exemption for beverages. And so that after the close of business, okay. 30 minutes after, they can do that. Okay. So, so, so we're, not, we're not precluding them from doing that. So, so they can still event, you can go and yeah. buy whatever. Yeah, and you can still sell months it's candy bars, yeah. but you just have to distribute them after school. But is, is it either? I way? got the sense that it was limited, even after school, in the sense that no, not no, a regular no. practice. But no, you can that do was okay. But you at, so do it in a regular practice at the event, as long as it's at the event. So if I'm having the soccer game on the soccer field and I want to do concessions, I have to do the concessions at the soccer field. So but you can't do a concession at a regular practice. No, that's not an event. And we've already been a part of this healthy Correct. for Correct. three years? Yeah. Longer than Longer. three years. I just gave you three years worth of data. Oh, okay. So we've already been doing it. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I just, but I'm new to the board and I yeah. hear these things and I just, I, it just, yeah. yeah. You know, it seems like a little heavy handed to me. And I don't think the students are fans of it. And I'm not saying that who cares what I don't really care what the students think when it comes to a lot of things, but if we're offering healthy snacks and they walk by it or it's you know it, I don't know. Philosophically I think you should eat healthy, like but Rice Krispie treats. Right. Well, there's still there's health. Health. There, there, yeah, because that's what I see on my mom. Yeah, my bill. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. Lots, lots of ice cream and lots of rice. Yeah, so they yeah. have to be formularies yeah. under the yeah. Connecticut okay. National Standards. Yeah. Nuts yeah. and nuts. Well, you can't have peanuts anyways. I know. We were just talking about this. <laughs> we, I was saying that some of we the have a few. We have a few students who are highly allergic, so we can't. We're not a peanut free, but we're peanut free. I don't. I don't. <laughs> There, there's terminology, but we're, yes, we encourage you not to eat food, please. <laughs> so there was also an attempt, I think it was last legislative session, to turn this into just this, this is the rules for schools. It didn't go very far, but my guess is within a few years, something like that's going to pass anyway. And we're, right, right, right. Into it. we're not getting any money back for it after that, but um, yeah. Like there's ice cream, yeah. there's chips. Is that what you want like, to be able to pass this? Yeah, it's, well, it seems. Uh, they just can't see it. Good. Smuggle in the red holes. Well, they can have it out in the. I just can't sell it. To no, I get it. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so they can carry it with them. Yeah. So what's the issue with reimbursable meals? What do you mean? Well, it says they that they're not covered. This is oh, sell, so, food, sell, so why isn't it reimbursable? So the meal? reimbursable meals fall under the federal guidelines, and this is a state of the Connecticut initiative. So the federal guidelines trump, trump so it, and it, we it's can what's now more, give them some no, unhealthy so, things. So it's could, what's more stringent. So yeah, even with whatever court law, whatever is what's more stringent, we have to follow what's more stringent. Okay. So um, the Connecticut nutritional standards, even if we don't go with it this way, we still have to follow more stringent guidelines than the federal USDA laws tell us to do. So there, there's so that's why it says separately from reimbursement. Yes. So I, I, the wording is awkward. Yeah. yeah so okay. because again, yeah. you are provided with you have to have five components. There has to be a whole grain. There has to be a fruit. There has to be a veg. Um, milk. Yeah. That's a veg. So there has, that makes up a reimbursable meal. Mm -hmm. So as long as your meal has that, it doesn't fall under the snack. Because so a snack would be separate from yeah, the meal in full. Okay. okay. Wow. So welcome to my world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion on that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm a no vote. Okay, I've got to do roll call then. Ah, then I'll say yes. <laughs> 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 if, I'm not going to make you guys roll roll, roll call for a. Uh, a no vote. Uh, go along to get along. <laughs> get along, right? Yeah, that's it. Nah.
I feel you. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's, I work in compliance and I know some of these little rules drive people, can drive people crazy. And if you look at the money, you say, ah, not worth it. So, plus the kids might feel like we gave them one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. We love the new school board. <laughs> the second part um, of the motion. The regional school district eight will allow the sale to students of food items that do not meet the Connecticut nutrition standards, provided that the following conditions are met. One, the sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Two, the sale is at a location of the event. And three, the food items are not sold from a vending machine or school store. An event is an occurrence that involves more than just a regularly scheduled practice, meeting, or extracurricular activity. For example, soccer games, school plays, and interscholastic debates are events, but soccer practices, play rehearsals, and debate team meetings are not. The regular school day is the period from midnight before to 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. Location means where the event is being held and must be the same place as the food sales. Okay, do I have- I'll make the motion. Okay, Scott Soyette made the motion. Do I have a second? Drew Golfin made the second. Do we have any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> I think we covered it all. Yeah, yeah that okay. one's easier at all. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Sorry, Mike, I did it to you again. Don't go slower. Aye. The um, third section of the motion, the regional school district eight will allow the sale to students of beverages not listed in section 10-221Q of the Connecticut general statutes provided following conditions are met. One, the sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Two, the sale is at the location of the event. And three, the beverages are not sold from a vending machine or school store. An event is an occurrence that involves more than just a regularly scheduled practice, meeting, or extracurricular activity. The school day is the period from midnight before to 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. Location means where the event is being held and must be the same place as the beverage sales. Do we have a motion? Okay, I'll make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> True golf and made the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Amy Romanchuk made the second. Any discussion? Go for it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion passes. Brings us to 10.5, the discussion and possible action related to improving educator diversity plan. It's in closure 10.5 in your package. And, and I could just speak briefly to this. Um, so uh, as I, the, the enclosure starts with just a cover memo to the plan itself. The state of Connecticut is now requiring school districts to submit a plan to them that outlines our efforts to uh, diversify our educator workforce. Um, prior to submission of state, the plan must be approved by uh, local and regional boards of education. Um, so I, I'll just say uh, anecdotally that, you know, the district administrators who facilitate the teacher hiring process and the educator hiring process are certainly well aware of the benefits of having a diverse, diverse educator workforce. Um, it is something that we um, talk about um, it's something that we certainly advocate for. Um, I, I will say uh, that as much as we advocate for it, there are inherent challenges associated with this. Um, I think the percentage is 11.8% of educators uh, in the state of Connecticut identify as diverse candidates. And essentially, we're all vying for the same uh, goal. We're all trying to diversify ourselves. We're required to try to do that. Um, right now, our percentage, uh, based off of the state information, our percentage of diverse educators in our district is 6%. Um, our approximate um, student population that um, for diverse students is approximately 15%. Um, and so, 
you know, we're, we're, we're in a place that we're better than some districts. We are not as good as others. Um, but my recommendation, and just, just to speak to the components of the plan, um, <clears throat> the four categories, or I'm sorry, the three categories of recruitment, hiring and selection and retention are the required categories that need to be included in the plan. And each of the components um, that are under each one of those categories are required to be highlighted a, as a part of our plan. Um, I could certainly answer any questions if people have them, um, but my recommendation to the board is to approve the plan so I can submit it to the state. Okay, so the motion to approve the Regional School District 8 Increasing Educator Diversity Plan for submission to the state. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion. Joe Coletti. Do I have a second? I'll second. Yep. Mike Sharon and do we have discussion on this okay all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries that brings us to 10.6 first read of policies so uh, I'll just go through these these are policies that did um, were discussed at the policy subcommittee that we had last week. The first one is um, is uh, board policy uh, 4118.5, 4218.5. Currently, this is a policy. This is not a policy. So we'd actually be approving this policy for the first time. In, our, in its current state, in our policy book, oddly enough, it's a regulation, not a policy. So what we'd be doing is we would be adopting the language that's in red so we have a red um, a red line version we would adopt the uh, the policy is in red uh, font that is recommended language from our attorneys at Shipman and Goodwin and then you could see for the administrative regulations that is more of a crosswalk between what our current regulation says plus some language that they are recommending that we um, include <coughs> in the regs as well. I can certainly take any questions or if there's any comments from anybody on the policy subcommittee that would like to weigh in. Yeah. I raised it the policy subcommittee. I still have some reservations about the language in this one. I know the lawyers have reviewed and said this is fine, but the the fact that it says we've installed computers um, on our board premises, uh, installed systems on our board premises. Um, well, a lot of the things that we care about now are not installed on our premises. They're in the cloud somewhere. They're, they're not things that we've, we've got, but we still <coughs> care about people abusing them. And and the the policy can be reads as though those are the ones that we care about, the, the ones that are installed on our premises. Just, it feels wrong. Um, and the other thing was, oh, <laughs> Uh, there's a language that says basically the use of the computer system represents an employee's acknowledgement that the employee has read and understands the policy and all applicable regulations. Well, the, you know, the use of the system says that you acknowledge this. If, if, I, if I said, if, you know, by reading this sentence, you agree to give me a million dollars, it is probably not enforceable um, unless they agree to it somewhere. Um, and I just don't know if we do. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm bothered by this this notion that we're saying, oh, just by using this, you're agreeing to, without ever saying that you're agreeing to. And uh, maybe when they onboard, they, you know, there's something that they sign that says that they'll they'll read it and abide by this policy. It probably is, but it's um, it's weird phrasing. Okay, so the, the, those are my two comments on this one. And the first one applies to the next policy as well. Any other discussion on that one? 10.6A. I can keep going. Yeah. Keep going. All right. Um, so uh, the next one is policy 6118, student use of a district computer system. Again, similarly, th similarly this is a, a, a policy that currently does exist. Um, and, and the changes that are being made in the policy are, in both the policy and the, recommend, uh, the recommended regulations are 
um, responsive to the model policies that are provided by Shipman and Goodwin. And um, again, uh, so our attorneys are recommending that we adopt the policy as is. I can certainly do my best to answer any questions. Same as the first one, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> is there an acknowledgement that happens? So it's a great question, and I can speak. To, so right now, um, there's not a specific acknowledgement that's given. I, I will tell you that the conversation that came out of the policy subcommittee uh, is we do think that it would be a good practice to include an acknowledgement of some sort. We're trying to figure out the best way to do that, whether it's when they get onboarded. Um, I will tell you that all new employees, when they're hired into the district, this has gone over in great length, what's appropriate use of technology and what's not appropriate use of technology. That's something that is discussed when we do a new teacher orientation, which would include all of the educators that we hire in district. Um, but we are figuring out the best way to do it because I do agree with what Scott's saying as far as having some type of an acknowledgement that we do understand. There also, I will say, is in the teacher handbook um, or the employee handbook, there it, it, it speaks to different policies that teachers need to be aware of or employees need to be aware of and, and adhere to as well. So, so it, is, it is covered in a variety of ways, but to your point, Scott, it's not specifically reviewed with them to say, you're checking the box, you're signing something, and we feel like that. Work for a lot of big companies in this area, and all the big ones, not all the small ones. When you, when you log into the system, the, you know, the first time you, you when you start it up and log in, there's a, a thing there that says, by using this system, you acknowledge whatever, and everyone just mm. skips by it. You know, I mean, maybe you read it once, maybe you never did, um, but it's, it's a common thing, just that kind of acknowledgement. You know, it's the same as the stupid licenses online that I agree to terms and conditions. Yeah, <laughs> sure, I'm going to read those. Well, and the other, I mean, annually we do an annual certification of several things mm -hmm. so it could you know could be across a couple different there, there, and there's a lot of policies that that probably would be a good practice to have just a, a, an annual acknowledgement of several different things and i think that's something that we need to move forward with. so all good thoughts anything else on that okay it brings us to 10.6 c so this one is assessments for students with disabilities let me just get to it um, alternative assessments for students with disabilities for statewide district assessments. And again, uh, much in line with a lot of the policy work that we're doing, it simply is aligning the language of our policy, which was last updated um, eight years ago with current legislation. Uh, the policy was reviewed by our special education administrators and they concur that the changes are appropriate. Any other discussion on that one? 10.6D. So 10.6D is the social networking policy, which we are updating. Um, it's a personnel policy, so it's specific to the use of social networking, social media by uh, employees. Again, being updated to align with legislative changes that have been made since the last time it was updated 11 years ago. Um, yeah, so I will note in here that one of the, because uh, I know that this question was asked by somebody and I want to make sure that I'm accurate when I say it, but this, um, one of the policies that we're looking to also make a change to is, uh, relates to eliminating language around the use of crowdfunding activities. So later on in the agenda, we're going to discuss our fundraising policy where we're striking information about fund crowdsourcing and, and using crowdfunding activities, which is like a GoFundMe type of a thing. Um, that language, the reason that we're striking it from the fundraising policy is because of the fact that it's covered under the social networking policy, because it talks about the fact that um, uh, if you look on page three, it says, no, 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 sorry. Basically, we're adding language that addresses the fact that we wouldn't use crowdsourcing. So I can certainly try to answer any questions people may have. Comments on that one? I just see that Google Plus is gone from there. 10.6e. <laughs> 10.6E is, policy 4212. thank you, 4212 appointments of non-certified staff. This is an easy one. I like easy. <laughs> this is a policy that pertains specifically to the appointments of non-certified staff, which would be paraprofessionals, clerical staff, custodial staff. For some reason, our current policy also has this hangout, st this statement that just kind of stands out at the end where it says the superintendent of schools shall be responsible for appointments 
to all the other positions requiring a certificate issued by the state of, state board of education. The reason we can strike this from our non-certified policy is we have a completely separate policy that covers the appointment of non-certified staff. It just doesn't make sense to reference one thing in a policy that is specific to something completely different. So the recommendation was clean up the language. And 10.6F is policy 1424. I just spoke to this. We're striking the crowdfunding here because it's going to be involved someplace else. Um, the next one is 6410G. Uh, 10.6G is 6146B. Um, the re and this is another one for consideration for deletion. Um, basically, there is um, law that says graduation requirements that are so we have graduation requirements as board policy. Um, if a student has an IEP, there's an ability for um, those modification stand, or I'm sorry, those graduation standards to be modified in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and, and that's, that's all part of law. And so essentially one of the things that we're trying to go through is that if there are simple one or two or three sentence policies that are covered in legislation, the recommendation is you can eliminate those policies. That's the, and, and so this is, a, this is a situation where the board can choose to um, uh, eliminate the policy or the board could choose to say, we wanna maintain this policy because we feel it's important to maintain the policy. If we did maintain the policy, the recommendation was eliminate it. However, if we decide to keep it, then I'd want to come back to the board because I'd want to make sure that the language is current with current legislation as well. So, uh, again, but the recommendation from, the, uh, from our legal firm was to delete that policy. Okay, and then the last one is 10.68, policy 6154.1. So, and, and this is the exact same situation as the last one, which is, there, this is one of those very quick and short and brief one or two sentence policies that is currently covered under Connecticut general statutes. It's unnecessary to have it in our policy book because even if we said, uh, you know, even if the language of the policy uh, didn't exist, we have to be compliant with this anyway, so. Any other discussion on the first read of policies? Why do you always look at me first? <laughs> <laughs> Right. No, no, no. Nope, that's it again. I'm going to look at my, nope. <laughs> All right. Um, that brings us to financials. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I can hand them over. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, in your packets, enclosure 10.7A um, is the expenditure and revenue report as of February 29th, 2024. Um, so, um, blah, 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 blah. so I am projecting a net favorable position of 862,985. However, having received our first excess cost payment and um, discovering that um, we are slated, projected to receive less than what was anticipated when we were budgeting plus some student movement, um, I am projecting a shortfall in revenue of $206,007. So that leaves a net favorable position of $656,978. And $656,978, there I go. Um, so on February 28th, we received our first payment of excess cost in the amount of $257,559. That amount includes any adjustments for the period, the prior period of March 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2023. And the final payment will be coming to the district at uh, around May 30th, 31st in that arena. Capital improvement is focusing on the remaining projects of the central office rooftop unit. There is no update as of the date that this memo was written. The facilities condition assessment, there's no updates Likewise, um, capital non-recurring um, is currently focusing on the phase one of the field improvement and drainage project will get underway um, once the contract has been finalized. So once um, the facility subcommittee meets on Tuesday, um, the superintendent will be able to negotiate the contract with the selected uh, vendor. 
And then in addition, Pupil Services is tracking changes through their IEP process and adjusting purchase orders accordingly. Are there any questions with what I have presented? Yeah, I, I assume you've seen the yeah. questions I've got. Yeah. So, so one was if I remember your questions correctly. So um, I'll start with the second one first. So um, the, in, these, in this packet that gets handed out, there is, um, you have different um, reports. One of the reports is the budget expenditure subject by object. So that is the Excel spreadsheet. Um, that doesn't look like an Excel spreadsheet, but that's where I do my projections. The next sheet is a revenue report that comes out of the um, system. And then um, we have a quite lengthy report that's titled DOE Personnel and Program Expenditures. I feel like that's like 35 pages or so. Okay. So out of that comes, um, out of that comes uh, um, the pupil services. So back in the day, um, before I got here, there was um, lots of overages in the um, special ed department area. So the board at that time wanted to see that broken out to be able to zone in and be able to ask questions as to why. So that's why there's two separate reports. So, But, but that is just a portion of the first correct, one. Correct. Okay. And then you have the capital improvement and then the capital non, uh, non-recurring fund reports. Right. Th those are separate accounts altogether. Correct. Separate from the 31 million or whatever correct. our budget is. Correct. Um, so let's see. Your second question was, I can't remember. Is it expected that we have uh, yeah. so much and so little in various places at so, the end of February? So budgeting is not a science. Mm -hmm. If we budget for what we know at the time, what we know. Um, unfortunately, as COVID has um, shown us, like we've many expect um, many uh, surprises for us. So in terms of salaries, you have substitutes, you have tutors, you have chaperones, you have overtime, um, additional hours that I can't encumber those because those are things that are going to come up on a daily basis. So I might need somebody to cover for the day. I might not need somebody to cover for the day. I might need a sub, but I don't have the sub, so I have to pay other people to do coverage of classes. Um, so I can't encumber those things. So you're going to see as the year goes on, you're going to see more and more get used up without the incumbents being there. Um, then, unfortunately, when we close the year, sometimes people have encumbered funds that we're going to release because they've never spent those funds, so they've held on to them, but they don't do a good job of monitoring to make sure that the invoices and, you know, like make an educated guess of what they might need for the end of the year. So it's a, it's a give and take that so we do our best. All right. I just, you know, the numbers struck, struck me as strange is that, you know, end of February is 47% of the budget unspent. I'm right there with you. Okay. That, that, <laughs> that, that felt odd. You know, we get what did you three say? months. No, I, didn't hear you. I said I'm right there with them. Because oh, okay. Unfortunately, so as you saw in um, the uh, unallocated personnel, it is about $500,000 or almost 560 sitting there. So, um, there's, you know, there's certain areas, certain pockets, so again, with special ed, they budgeted for students, but the students are doing better. We brought them back. Whatever the case may be, the services may have ended. They don't need those services anymore, so that's savings to the budget. So it's not something that we're in total control of to say, hey, we're just going to keep giving the kid services whether he needs them or not. Yeah. So, yeah. What, I, what I would say is, you know, so personnel is obviously yeah. a big driver, right? We, we just talked about the surplus that we had that we're, you know, we're keeping 2% from last year, we're keeping 2% and we're giving a, a good number to the towns as a credit offset. And, and the personnel is, was the lion's share of that dollar amount, I think $840,000. Um, and I said this, I don't think I said this to the board, but I, I don't know what happened during the pandemic, but there was a lot of people that just decided they don't need to work anymore. I, I wasn't fortunate enough to be amongst that group, um, but, but we have vacancies. Vacancies exist across the district. Vacancies exist across all the districts, right? I'm sure Colchester's dealing with it. I'm sure that Marlboro's, like, and so, you know, I, I, I would be remiss if we said, well, hey, we're short two custodians. We've been short two custodians for, for six months. Let's just take those out of the budget because we need those two custodians, right? right. 
And so the same thing could be said for paraprofessional positions and the same thing could even be said for our substitutes because we budget based off of the number of subs we anticipate needing based off of historical use of subs. The problem is, is that our sub pool is dwindling. And so we don't have substitutes that are available. In a perfect utopian world, we'd be fully staffed. We'd be getting substitutes for each absence where we needed a substitute. But it's it's far from a perfect world at this point, right? But if we affected our, and I'm not saying you're suggesting this, but if we if we eliminate our budget or reduce our budget, and then all of a sudden circumstances change and we can hire a custodian, we can hire those pairs and we can fill those sub vacancies, then we don't have enough budget to do that, right? And that's that's the challenge that we have. It's a fine line. <laughs> it, it, it's a fine line. And that's that's the, the situation. I mean, even, you know, again, I'll just go back to, you know, my conversation I talked earlier about the Marlboro request. And during one of those conversations, somebody said, well, you have some vacancies. Why don't you just take those out of your budget? I said, because I would be doing a disservice to our students if I did that. And I'm not going to do that. And, 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 and I, I, you know, and I think that we do the best that we can with the information that we have. Um, but going back to what you initially started with, it's, it's not a science. I mean, it is, a, it is just, it ebbs and flows. And we, we could hire a custodian for two months and it, they move on to something else because there's tons of job opportunities for them. You know, we, we, we are, we're losing Paris. You, 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 the board has heard me talk about that. I think that we need to be more competitive with regards to our salaries for our non-certified and certified staff. We're, 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 people are finding at a time where employees have the choice now to move to different places. And, you know, it's, uh, I'll get off my soapbox, but that's, it, it's, a, it's a challenging situation that we find ourselves in primarily due to staffing issues. So when I look at the net position, the question I would have is I, I see a budget balance of 2.4 million, essentially. Mm -hmm. and, and I would have expected more of that to be encumbered and you seem to be taking care of that in anticipating additional additional how is that so from what, an accounting perspective how, how are you so what i go through and i make educated guesses if i need to talk to the department head i talk to the department head to see what still is going on um so again we have about 135,000 as of today left in um teacher subs did I encumber all of it? I think, no, because I figure we're not going to spend all of it. So I do a calculation to get me to the end of the year based on what was spent in the prior month, and then I encumber that. So your encumbrance, so encumbrance is a, based on sort of your run rate. Correct. And then you decided to add a little more of that because the run rate might not continue. Right. You so, might so, actually, yeah, so more or less, yeah. Yeah. So that's how did, that's in, why it's projected. I just asked it. So you add it to I hate to use the word, right? I don't want to use the wrong word here, but um, you put in a margin. Right. Okay. So we could end up with much more. Unfortunately. Well, yeah. then it goes back to the time. Yeah, right. right. But you can't do that all the time. Right. That's not right. 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 Okay. Good. Okay. Any other questions on that one? Okay, so um, seven ten point seven B, the food service. So um, food service again um, runs us through the end of February, and the program is currently reflecting a loss of seventy six thousand three hundred and seventy seven dollars. Um, there still is a positive fund balance, but unfortunately for this year, we seem to be um, a little. Um, deflated in in um, getting the kids to participate and or. I'm not, so again, you may have read the Rambler <laughs> article of this week that, um, again, we do it, we try to communicate to families to explain that we don't drive um, how we charge for students. We, we set the prices, but the state of Connecticut um, has decided to allow for free breakfast this year and to treat free and reduce students as free and everybody else has to pay for lunches. Um, unfortunately, we don't have say in that matter. We try to influence. I um, mean, if we could do universal free, that would be lovely again, because then I don't feel like I'd have to do chasing everything and it's eight more because they were in there. But unfortunately, um, some of them are boycotting. It is what it is. 
I'm so trying. Boycott it. Because <laughs> they don't want to pay the prices. Eat. Yeah, they don't want to pay. So they don't eat. So they, don't eat. So they, bring, they pack it from home. Oh. They're brown bag. Are there any additional questions or questions on that? So, how is the fun balance start at the start of the year? What's so, in there? So, it's what rolled forward from the prior year. So, we started with a fund balance of $274.25. So, it seems like, why would, given what the track record so far, that we're not getting enough revenue, how come we had so much to start? Oh, because of the COVID years, we were flush. So, oh. um, they fed all the children for free. So, they. But we got the money from the Recovery Act. Yeah, all, all uh, of that, all yeah, of that came all into that play. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we got we got a lot of money from the feds. Yeah. And got fattened us up, and right. that's carrying us right now. Correct. But we're driving ourselves into the ground. Correct. Okay. What's the plan? <laughs> um, to try to get the kids excited about eating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Okay. Our Do friend. we? I'm sorry, but do we throw away a lot of food yeah. if they're not eating it? No, we... no. So um, the kitchen does a great job. So again, you, that's where you try to build in your margins. So actually, when they come do and come through and do an administrative review, the state of Connecticut does this. Um, they will look to see how much food is wasted, and they try to keep it keep you at a certain amount. And so they're actually doing a great job of making sure that so they know if they have uh, the nachos. They know all the kids are going for nachos. They're making less sandwiches because that line is out the door for nachos. Okay. So that's. <laughs> You're first in line, right? Taco salads are very yummy. <laughs> all right. Any additional questions? Just something you mentioned, the Rambler. That's a student newspaper. Yes. Is it email? We believe it or not, we we do old school. Um, which is, I think is great. Yeah. So we, it's actually hard. And I actually have, I had versions to bring down this evening, but I only had eight and I didn't want to have anybody left out. So I will make sure you get the copy of the most current member of the community edition. So, yeah, they are emailed to parents, right? Yeah. Like so, so that, no, what's, what's emailed to parents is the um, newsletter from uh, Penny Bryceville yeah. and, and uh, Dr. Sharusi sends the Rambler to the middle school, but the Rambler that Eve is talking about is the, um, the quarterly edition. It's the yeah, the student, yeah, it's the student-created student newsletter, yeah. um, magazine, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that'd be great to see. I, yeah, I worked on student great. papers when I was in high school. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, they're great. So, all right. So on to um, student activity report. So as of February 29th, um, we are in balance with Webster Bank. Um, I know you had a question, or Mr. Soyet had a question about the digital signage. So I'm going to push that over to Colin. Yeah, so so there is 32, $34,000. So, so there's a line. So I think back in 2017, the previous high school administration, um, Scott Leslie, had started having conversations with our um, the graduating classes. Uh, they have money that they've gotten through fundraising and dues and whatnot, and it's not uncommon for senior classes to leave money to make donations to the schools for a particular project, right, um, or a particular item uh, that, that could have some, some cost to it. And there was a, a desire to have a digital sign out in front of, like, on Wall Street, um, out in front of the, the school, kind of in between the entrance um near the 316 field and um what's that oh so before parents basically across from the park yep. across from the park entrance um i think it's a great idea i've talked a little bit about this with the facility subcommittee um we have again approximately thirty four thousand dollars in a student activity fund so what it's been is over the years different senior classes have made donations to kind of build this fund up with the idea of once there's enough money in this particular fund that we can move forward with the digital sign. Um, there's prohibitions in Hebron uh, from the Planning and Zoning Committee uh, about um, digital signs are not allowed. So in order for us to actually be able to move forward with doing this project, two things, two things would need to happen. We would need more money. Um, we would need uh, because the the thirty four thousand dollars is not adequate would not adequately um, 
uh, fund this project. Um, and uh, so we need to build up at least probably double the amount of money where we currently have. Uh, the, the other thing that could happen is the board can make a decision to allocate, if it was the prohibitive of the board to allocate money from capital not recurring or potentially from funding that we might find ourselves in future years from a situation where we are, our net favorable position is, is, is a good one. Um, but then we also would have to go through the process of getting the exemption from the town planning and zoning committee. Um, and I don't know how heavy of a lift that would be. Um, so I've had conversations with the town manager um, about what, what that process would look like. We'd have to go there. We'd have to talk to the planning and zoning committee. And the problem is, is that they would say to us, well, we want to see exactly what the sign looks like. I don't know what the sign would exactly look like because of the fact that I don't know how much money I'm going to have available to me. So I'm in this weird place where it's what comes first, the, ch the chicken or the egg. Um, and that's, but that's the, that's the money. That's okay. what the money's intended for. So what happens if we never come to agreement with the town? What happens to the funds well, when they were donated for a purpose? I have to reach back out to those classes and see what they would like for me to go to. Okay. They could redirect it. Correct. They could ultimately make a choice and reallocate the money. Wow. I, I think it's, I, I, you know, my my perspective on it, and again, we've talked about it at the facility subcommittee once last year, um, is I think it's an advantage not only to the district to have digital signage that could provide a lot of information mm -hmm. to members of the community about what events that are taking place at the school, but I think it would be appropriate to to have community notifications, right? If there whether there's an emergency situation, whether they're we're promoting the um, what was the maple. You know, the, the, the Maple Fest, you know, there's, I, I think that there is an inherent benefit to it because it, it would it would work for a variety of, you know, if we, once we get our generator, we're going to be a shelter. We're going to be a right. regional that, shelter. That like would we be can, an angle. We can, we can, we can talk, you know, like that's something that we'd want to put up, you know, regional shelter here, you know, here, here's phone numbers to contact if you're in a situation. So I think there's a real benefit, not only to the school district, but also to the entire community. Um, and that is, I, I like the term, that is the angle that I, I would absolutely use with, with trying to get the, the planning and zoning committee to, to allow something like that. Yeah. Can we add this to an agenda soon? Because I think this is a good idea. I think maybe the board could could come up with funds or mm -hmm. you know talk to a senior class and say, can you give, give this much? And we'll, we'll yeah. pay the rest for a reasonable size. Sure. Absolutely. Well, who would get estimates on what the sign would cost? So, so I have had, so, <laughs> so, I've had conversations with a company that Scott had initially engaged with, Scott Leslie had initially engaged with. Um, there are a variety of, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, stands or um, foundations or whatever it would be that the sign would be wrapped in, right? You know, the you sign. can, what's that? The sign. Yeah, the, 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 you know, I, I, think, I think that we would best our best chances of um, our best chances of getting the planning and zoning committee to be agreeable, based off of information that I've just picked up through anecdotal conversations, is a a very traditional look, right? Something that would match the building, so a brick and mortar type of a thing instead of something that looks more modern. That is, you know, uh, some type of a you know aluminum or something like that. So, no a Vegas sign. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think we have no, no, no Vegas. <laughs> Um, so, you know, again, be, because we were in this situation last year where it just was, there were so many different moving parts. I did initially have conversations after I'd spoken to the, to the, um, facility subcommittee around the time that I was speaking to the facility subcommittee. Um, but essentially knowing that it was kind of like, we were kind of stuck in this place, but if, if it's the desire of the board to, Hey, this is a good idea and let's, let's see. What we could do i could certainly get updated quotes i could certainly get them to essentially get this company to kind of mock up what it would look like um and then we would just have to get some some estimates for what we think the uh construction costs and the material costs would be um and and that's something i could certainly do I, i'd love to do it if this board is interested in helping you know fund something like that um it's something i definitely could, could work on it simply makes sense to me to have you know a digital sign, just thing, something we can change quickly. And like you said, an emergency situation in town, boom, it 
they call you up and here's here's a new message. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, I'm good. All right. So hearing no more on that, um, 10.7D is the stiff account. Um, so at the end of February, we reinvested $1,532.94 back into the account. Um, I also provided um, the daily rates for the month, and for the most part, they held steady for the whole month of February. Are there any questions that the board may have on that? Okay, hearing none. Um, 10.7E is the budget appropriation transfer. So these are transfers that as per board policy I have to bring. So these transfers, the 36 transfers are from January um, through, uh, through the end of February. Um, and they total $616,204.42. $218,000 of that is um, Journal entry 136, that's where I moved available or what we felt was going to be available um, insurance or health insurance costs up to unallocated due to um, changes in enrollment, staff movement, and um, or vacancies. So um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, um, then a motion to move. I move to make to uh, approve the transfers as presented. That was Scott Soyet. Do we have a second? I'll second. Mike Bollier, any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Committee reports. All right, I'll start us off for the facilities subcommittee. Uh, there was a joint meeting held on March 14th between the facilities and the finance subcommittees. We've talked about all the topics tonight uh, during the regular agenda, uh, but I will say that we have a meeting coming up next Tuesday, the 26th, um, is our next meeting. That's it for facilities. Okay, finance, audit, compliance, and insurance. We had that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Not that sure was how much I could add to that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, negotiations. Uh, we so I we have not had a meeting yet. Uh, there has not been uh, any movement with scheduling. I will tell you, we just received a communication from the uh, uh, non-certified bargaining unit saying that they are ready to go, which we've been waiting to get that uh, information from them. Um, and some members of the negotiation subcommittee should anticipate hearing from me, hopefully sometime, if not this week, hopefully by uh, the end of next week to try to get at least our initial uh, meeting with our non-certified group. And just, just to re remind, I, we have now have two different non-certified groups. We have our custodians and, and clerical staff as kind of group one or group two, but, you know, so there's, and then we have our, our, our parents as another one. So. It's just going to mean a couple more meetings, and I need to figure out the logistics if we're going to try to do like one, you know, one group for a couple hours and then same night another group for a couple. We just have to figure out the logistics of it, but you'll hear from me uh, hopefully soon. So they did manage to split. <laughs> they did. Yep. They are, they are officially split. Correct. So policy? Um, we've met, we've presented, uh, gone, going through, you saw the second reads and the first. First reads today. Um, it's moving along. There's we had some lively out discussion. There. You know, with, I mean, we, we didn't. There were no issues that we were going to bring to the board, except what Scott mentioned on the first read of some of the technology-related items. But there was some definite probing of the legal ease and so forth and all of these. So, but we were satisfied with that. Okay. Program and communication. Haven't met. Um, there's uh, really. This is a group that meets pretty infrequently, just because of the fact that as things come up, we meet. Um, there were, had initially been a meeting, at least on the calendar for this Thursday. There's really not a uh, need to have a meeting, so we're good to go. My first introduction to that. I guess a little late. So, uh, Carrie's not here, right? Uh, yeah, she's not. Okay. 
Okay, that brings us to item 12, public comments. Hebron Andover and Marble community engagement and attendance at BOE public meetings is welcome. Public comment segment of the meeting agenda is set aside so the BOE may receive public comments. Procedurally, public remarks will be limited to three minutes and citizens will be asked to identify themselves. Because the BOE is limited by the Freedom of Information Act to discussing only matters on the agenda, the BOE is not permitted to engage in a discussion of the comments presented. Do you have anybody that would like to make public comment? Okay, that brings us to um, item 13, the informational items. Uh, so the first thing is just calendar events. So I'll just highlight again, there's, there's events for both the middle school and the high school found within your board packet, uh, enclosure 13.1A and 13.1B. Um, we have our spring concert coming up for our high school this Thursday, which I'm very much looking forward to. They always put on a phenomenal show. Um, we also have on April 4th, we have, um, what's called project, uh, Project Empty Bowls or the Empty Bowls Project. Um, I, I don't think it's a it's a fundraiser that's done every year. I believe it's usually every couple years or maybe it was affected by COVID. I know they didn't have it last year, um, but essentially what it is just for, for people to understand is um, students, staff, local people who can throw bowls. I, I am not amongst that group, you know, on a pottery wheel will we'll make bowls. And um, then what happens is uh, they get glazed and uh, we have a, a stockpile of these bowls. Um, and what happens is um, at, for Project Empty Bowls or Empty Bowls Project, um, members of the community can come to the school. They can pick out a bowl for $15. Uh, they can pick out a bowl. They then uh, can fill that bowl with soup and, and, and have a, a, that's been donated by local um, organizations. And the proceeds for this event um, are, uh, go to the Hebron Interfaith Food Bank, Marlboro Food Bank, and Andover Congregational Ch uh, Church. So it's a fundraiser for, for our food banks. To, uh, I, I heard about it last year. Um, as I said, they didn't do it last year, so I'm super excited to do it. That's April 4th. If board members are interested in attending that, um, we do. Uh, there's information that's sent out to uh, families uh, of, of students, but if you don't have a student in RAM anymore, shoot me an email and I will provide uh, you the information on how you can sign up to, to do that. It's a, it sounds like it's just a great event. So uh, at the um, middle school, um, we will have, uh, I think it's next Thursday is the middle school coffee house. Um, it's either next Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday, I can't quite recall. Um, it really, really nice event. It's from six, six to eight o'clock. It's just highlighting the amazing talents of our middle school students um, and, and certainly looking forward to that. Um, down the line, there's a drama production for Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. That's actually um, in April um, and, and certainly one big upcoming event it, that I think many of us students and staff alike are thinking about is uh, we have spring break in a few weeks. So um, <laughs> there, there's there's some anticipation for that coming up. Um, we're, we're looking forward to it. We're loving the warm weather, loving the longer days and uh, you know, we're, we're getting closer to uh, summertime. So. Yeah. Both of them mentioned both high school and middle school, the All Town Jazz. You, you, you'd asked about that. So so if I'm remembering correctly, the All Town Jazz is is basically the elementary districts have their students from um, have their have their bands. They they'll come and they'll perform. So it's 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 I, Eric, am I getting this right? It's more than just all town, it's it's all of the towns. It's so it's Andover Elementary School, Hebron Elementary School, and Marlboro Elementary School all have their bands. They come to RAM and they perform. Then our middle school band and our high school band perform. And then one of the things that they, I think this was last year they did this, and I'm assuming they'll do it again, is the teachers from those bands will then perform as kind of like a, a, an ensemble as well. Um, and it's a really, really, really good event. It's a really good event. Yeah. Really is all time. I just wonder if we're definitely doing both schools or something. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, no, it's it, it again, it's it's all the three towns that feed into us as well as <coughs> ours. And then just uh, obviously there's information related to uh, middle school and high school in and out of school suspensions that people can do. And that concludes mine. Okay. 
We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> second. <laughs> that was Mike Bolger, and the second was Scott Soyat done. Uh, all in favor? Uh, <laughs> opposed? Don't you dare. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good discussion. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Anyone ever been in a meeting where somebody voted against?